So I'm Dwayne Butcher. I'm the um, right now the chargé d'affaires at the American Embassy here, which means that I'm the not the ambassador, but the, the diplomat in charge in the absence of an ambassador. I'm a, um, a career diplomat. I've been working in the, for the United States Foreign Service for the last 25 years, which doesn't is not doesn't seem as long as it sounds. I will say it seems like yesterday I joined. Um, it, in a certain sense, it's not an inspiring or surprising career path because my father was also a United States diplomat and was born uh, as he was on assignment overseas in Turkey. And I spent almost my whole childhood traveling or moving from place to place with him around Europe and Africa and Asia. Um, I think my father's story is a more inspiring one than mine. He grew up in Oklahoma. Um, his, he was the first person in his family to go to university and he went on a sports scholarship. Uh, they didn't have any money for university, and he went because he was a good athlete. Um, and uh, so I sort of grew up with this sense that we were these frontiersmen, uh, even though, we, even though, of course, I grew up in a diplomatic new home, a very comfortable um, emissary of the United States, and in a variety of very interesting places. And we had this story of the, you know, sort of the classic American story of the, the, the young person who comes from humble beginnings, and that was my father. He was a, um, he is an inspiring person. And, remains so. Um, I was, I didn't really focus on how lucky I was, like, as most kids probably don't. I, I, I moved from place to place. I, my first memories are from Germany. Um, I have other memories from Saudi Arabia, from, from Sweden. You know, I finished my high school in, in uh, Kenya. And my first experience of education in the United States was uh, in university, um, which it was interesting, you know, that, that I would follow that path. I, I, I didn't feel called to that path. I, I didn't always think that's what I will do. I didn't know what I would do. I thought I might go to law school. I might do something else. I might end up in diplomatic service. And I ended up um, just thinking I would take a small break from school because I was tired of, of learning and I wanted to do something else. And in our foreign service, you can you can just take an exam. It's free. If you pass the exam, you can join the foreign service and they don't care what degrees you have. You don't have to have a graduate degree or anything. And I thought in my little break before law school, I would see what it was like. I would put my toe in the water. And, and then I, I went, was sent off. I joined in, in the summer of 1988. Uh, I was 20, 22 years old. And I joined and was packed off to Muscat, Oman. And I thought it was like the best thing ever. This was so much more fun than school. And I, I loved it. And I had all these people, happy people working for me and doing whatever I told them to. And, and um, it was very exciting, Muscat Oman. I remember my aunt, who was also a diplomat, also a foreign service officer, said, that's like real foreign service. And, and it was, it was. I have very distinct memories of, of arriving in the, in the embassy at the time, which was an old Turkish fort made of mud. And, and the, the deputy ambassador greeted me, welcomed me to the post, chomping on a big unlit cigar. And the, there were these wooden windows open, sort of shutters open, plantation shutters open and behind him, and you could see the American flag kind of snapping in the breeze and another fort out of the window with these palm trees. And it, it really felt like I was in a movie. And uh, it was just a, 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 life, a life that completely, completely suited me. And I thought, I mean, I don't know in the time, I don't think that I said, okay, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life, or I'm going to do this as long as I can. Um, I certainly never thought I would be in charge of an embassy. but. It was a good fit. I liked it. And I, I went from there to Munich, Germany, which was about as opposite place as you could imagine uh, from Oman and continued I, there. I did consular work, which was, you know, much more taking care of American citizens. Really. There are a lot of tourists and things happen to in Munich and, and uh, we take care of them. I remember at Oktoberfest, I always wanted to look under the tables because I thought there must be passports down there. You know, that so many Americans would show up at the embassy with no passport. And I thought whenever I was at the Oktoberfest that if I looked under the table, I would find some of those passports. Um, but it was a, you know, it was a exciting assignment. And, and uh, from there, I was assigned to Baku, Azerbaijan in the very, very early days. And I think that, you know, in a certain sense, I, I've i rarely been in the center of history, but I've always kind of followed the history a, a little bit. And so during the fall of the Berlin Wall, of course, I was in Oman. Um, in, during, but I, of course, I was in Oman at the beginning of the, of the first Gulf War. So. It, we were just on the edge of the action there. The, the, and in Germany, I was, you know, there a year or two after the wall fell, and then I got to Baku about two years, three years after they became independent. And uh, still early enough to be very challenging and exciting, and um, have to explain to people where that really was and what we were doing there, but such an exciting and fun place to, to serve. And, and um, from there, I went back to Washington, as one must do, to work at headquarters for a while. 
you learn, it is not as exciting as being overseas, but you learn a lot about your institution and your profession. And uh, I did that for two years. I made many of the friends that I, that I still have today and learned a lot about how the organization works. Um, and actually from that, from there, I was, I was originally supposed to, I was assigned to Belgrade, but that was 1999. And Belgrade didn't turn, didn't look like it would work out. And I was therefore, I uh, changed my assignment. I finished Serbian training and I started Romanian training. And uh, after six months of Romania, and it was something January of 2000, I was sent here. And I spent, uh, I suppose, about a year and a half here, working in the old embassy of Tudor Arcasi. And we lived in Escuela Floriasca. And I was newly married with my, to my wife from Azerbaijan. And uh, then, you know, we did, it was, it was a, a very fun assignment here. But then, of course, things changed in Serbia. And I, I sort of, I remember watching on CNN as they pulled, drove the bulldozer up to the to the city hall or the problem to the parliament building in, in Belgrade and I thought you know I think my phone has got ringing and and you know which is rare it's a fun thing to have you don't usually see something on CNN and connect it to your own life and then my phone rang I was actually in the baggage claim in the Budapest airport I was going to Budapest for a conference and my phone rang and I said how would you like to go to Belgrade for three weeks and my wife was pregnant at the time and I thought she might like to go back and see her mom and dad while she could still travel and so I said honey how would you like to go to Baku for a few weeks and she said sure and then she said why <laughs> and so I sent my wife to Baku and I went to Belgrade and uh, had a very exciting time I was part of the first team and I actually was the first American family diplomat to fly in after the war and I remember a very interesting moment when I handed over my diplomatic passport to the border guard and he looked at it looked at it and then he handed it to his colleague and I thought, okay, what's going on here? And then they just waved me through. In those days we had to do diplomatic relations. One of my employees picked me up in his personal car and took me to the hotel and um, we, we started from from a few hotel rooms and uh, sort of rebuilt an embassy out of nothing. And, and for me, that was that's really one of the amazing opportunities. And, and you, you learn something. You are one of the luckiest to have the opportunity to build from zero to something. There is um, there's your advice for your for, for your viewers is be lucky. Um, the, the you're quite right. The I will I do have to say that one of the things I learned was of course I, I wasn't quite building from nothing. It looked like I was building from nothing. But what we had in Belgrade was the core of employees who had always worked at that embassy, who were a very fine and very professional group of employees. And so what I learned very clearly then was embassies are not buildings embassies are people and that's probably true of every organization i don't yes. think that's something special about diplomacy i think that companies government organizations government agencies ngos they're people and what we learned was like that i could appear magical because i could snap my fingers and suddenly there was an embassy there were there was a motor pool there was a you know and in those i remember just feeling so powerful i would say i think we need cars i think we need a motor pool and my employees went away and made a few phone calls and the next day there were three drivers and three cars available and there we were and um, we had uh, we, we had you know we were able to also pick and choose this very experienced and very professional staff and we, we were actually there to go back into the embassy at, that had been abandoned for many many months and it was uh, it was also a very happy time you, you don't you don't know what to expect after after a conflict you don't know how you'll be received and and we were quite nervous in the beginning we weren't sure we should leave the hotel but after a few days, we, we we couldn't stand to stay in the hotel any longer. And, it, and when you leave the uh, the Hyatt in, in Belgrade, there are all these boats tied up against the river that are served as restaurants and bars. And so we went. And our first experience was we found we, we weren't the the only negative is we were not allowed to pay for our beer. That they were so happy that the Americans had come back to, to Belgrade in spite of the war, that we were we were celebrating. And we, we found this old Russian icebreaker that was a restaurant called the Mozart. And we went there. We took just my me and my one friend, and then we came back with two more friends the next day and then at one point we had to warn them that even though we were up to 32 we probably wouldn't bring 64 people the next day um but we um we had the, it was just a very very special feeling and um i built up a rapport with that team and then when when i was done there of course i came back after my three weeks i was asked if i if i would be willing to break my assignment at bucharest and go to go to belgrade and my my call was to the medical officer to say okay can i take a baby to belgrade because by then we would have a baby and um they said about maybe we'd be fine in Belgrade. And so we, we did move to July of 2001, moved over to, to serve the next three years in Belgrade and to continue with this process of rebuilding this embassy. Um, although by then we're talking about buildings, but because the people were in place. 
um, after that, I maybe as as a as a, a sense of reward that that had been a job well done, I, I was assigned to to uh, one of the secret treasures of, of life in the foreign service, which is to serve as consul general in Hamburg, Germany, which is an amazing city and an amazing job. And it doesn't necessarily have too much to do with diplomacy. It has a lot to do with public relations, um, but it's a lovely office and and. Americans are, you know, it's a city which is, well, it's low profile in some ways. It's a real world city, you know, a city with a huge tradition of, of reaching out towards uh, towards the Anglo-Saxon world and the, and the United States. And so much history for Americans is just amazing to think that they, I went to Bremen on my call and the, the, they showed me a room in the Chamber of Commerce building in Bremen where they toasted the discovery of America. <laughs> And it was a room you can stand in. And I mean, I, you know, that, that's something very, you know, I was also, I studied history. That was my, that was my major in college. And I think that, that, that room in 1492, that chamber of commerce was already a chamber of commerce. And they celebrated the discovery of America there. Um, the, you know, in, in Germany, they don't offer you the, the range of challenges that you might find in a, in a place like Azerbaijan or a, or a place like Belgrade. But it is still a lot of fun. And you know, it's, it, it was a, there was a big healthy debate about America's role in the world, about the what was going on in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and so we were we were very busy, and we, we had plenty to do. And so if we didn't feel that we were at the kind of the edges of worrying about our safety, we were still um, we still felt like there was there were, there were challenges for us. And Germans love to engage, and love to converse, and love to listen, and love to talk, and we had a great debate all the time, and it was a, it was a very fun assignment. And, um, after that, I went to Uzbekistan. So I was trained in Russian, and I was sent off to to Tashkent to serve as the deputy ambassador there. And the, the one the odd connection that remains with Bucharest was that in 2008 at the NATO summit, President Karima of, of Uzbekistan offered the use of Uzbekistan's rail lines for the NATO forces in Afghanistan. So when I arrived around that time, then our job was to actually put that promise into operation and to negotiate with the Uzbeks for, the, for that, that purpose. And so that was sort of the centerpiece of what we did there. Um, Uzbekistan is a, an interesting, challenging place. It's not a Western democracy, and we, we consistently advocate for human rights there as well as working on our strategic interests. And so it's a, a balancing act of working closely with our Uzbek partners on strategic interests that we have in common, but at the same time advocating for, for human rights and, and rule of law, business climate issues. And it was uh, there we had, for, for whatever reason, uh, the, my third year there, they, they did not assign us an ambassador. And so I had the privilege and the honor of serving as Charge d'Affaires there also for the last year that I, that I served there. And that was, a, of course, for me, a great opportunity to kind of do my boss's job. And, you know, all my jokes are funny. It's something I really like. <laughs> um, Tashkent is a, a very comfortable place to live as an expatriate, and, and you you certainly feel like you're really on the cutting edge there, that you're really doing important work that not many people can do. And we saw a lot of the top generals and the Secretary of State was there, and we it was a, it was a unique, challenging experience. And so anyway, that was, um, from there, I came back to Romania. So I felt like maybe there was, there was work not finished there, and so I brought my family, now two boys and my wife, back to, to Bucharest, where we arrived in 11, and here then I was, I was here then for the for the for from around the fall of 11 we organized the signing of the ballistic missile defense agreement president Pesescu's trip to washington and then the very eventful winter and spring and then the even more eventful summer of 2012. Um, and then we followed all of the political crises through uh through the election and then ambassador Kittenstein's departure in, in december of 2012 and at that point i think we expected that after the election, we would probably have an ambassador in two or three months, maybe five or six months at most. Of course, that was nearly 13 months ago. And so I've had the pleasure of um, winning most of my arguments in the building and having most of my jokes be funny for uh, for almost 13 months now. Um, and of course, here we're in a place where we're we're in a very happy place to, to be diplomats, that we have very issues that we think are terribly important, but we also have a very hospitable, comfortable environment where people are willing to listen to us, where where America stands for something, where where we, you know, the doors never slammed in your face, that not everyone agrees with you all the time. Um, that would be boring. We wouldn't need diplomats if we always agreed. Um, but where where it seems that that there's an appreciation for, for what we are. Maybe almost, I mean, it's almost a, a, a too much responsibility, I think, sometimes to think that just what 
the high opinion people have of us. And we see these um, amazing numbers. We see that 78 percent of Romanians have a favorable opinion of America, and you know we pick our polls. Of course, we we find the ones we like the best. But but the uh, the it, it's clearly a place where where we're able to to make a difference, and and um, that's what we you know. I think that the big challenge here, um, one of the challenges here, is a level is a a sense of apathy that we sometimes detect that people think they can't make a difference. I think that's why organizations like yours are so special, uh, because I think people need to be taught that they can make a difference. And I think this is something that everyone is wrestling with. I think when we see the European elections, we're going to see that there's enormous levels of frustration around the around all of the Western democracies about what are we, where are we, where are we going, what's going on here, and you, we see this in the United States as well. I think we we may have an advantage in that we have this national myth of the the self-made man, the American dream, the, the the immigrant who appears who arrives with nothing, the you know the young man whose family's never been to college, who, who becomes a, a foreign service officer, the the that we are steeped in this from the time when we were very young, and I think that may help us that that we're told you should make it on your own, and and I think that that, that that's not always a, I mean that's sometimes it's an easy message, too easy a message, but I, think, I do think we benefit from that, but the, you know here I think that there's been a much more complicated history and that people are wrestling. At the same time, I think one of the messages we learned from our from our visit that was taken was ultimately where Romania goes will be in the hands of the Romanians, and we will help along the way. But uh, there are real limits to what we what we do, what anyone can do. And uh, but anyway, it makes the it makes the job a very entertaining one. And um, of course, I also have a terrific staff here to help. And it's, it's nice that I can claim credit from a lot of other for, for a lot of other people's really good work. <laughs> Something that that I appreciate a lot. And uh, I suppose that's me. That's where I am. And what are your advice for advices for uh, the people who want to learn from your experience? Yes, as I as I as I think on that, and you know, I've, I was warned to, to think that over since we since since we talked, and I think you know, it's hard to it's hard to boil things down to any any one or two bits of advice. I, I think that I think what what people need people need to try to make a difference, whatever they're doing. They have to decide what's important to them, and they have to try to make a difference. And it's it's not good enough to just say, well, that's how things are. Wait for someone to fix things. You can't wait to win the lottery. You can't. You, you, you just can't do that. And if you're lucky, that's great. But I think also people make make luck. Uh, I mean, you know, you can't always be born to a billionaire or born to an American diplomat. But you people who want things enough make things happen. People who try hard enough, they make good things happen for themselves or for for the causes that they're interested in. I think what's maybe I'm most appreciative in in my life is some. Um, is the the chance to meet meet so many people from so many unbelievably varied backgrounds that the the that the you know growing up as I did and then in the in the in, in the business I've been in that you know I've met I've met the people you read about in books the people people who are historic figures people who are who are struggling against great adversity um, you know pe people who, who develop NGOs on their own people who people who fight for human rights in Uzbekistan where that can and will put them in jail. And you, you, you have great admiration for those people, and and you know I think that I mean in some I, I mean I, I touched on this before when I was talking about opening up Belgrade. The world is made of people. The people make the world. The the, the the networks of people. The people the people you meet. I think I think I mean one bit of a practical advice I have is to hang on to everyone you meet. It's much easier now with Facebook and with, with computers and everything that, that we can we can stay in touch. There's no reason to lose touch with anyone. Now. You, you can always stay there. And I, I have a. A friend who's a terribly successful foreign service or multiple ambassador, and one of the things she did back in the 1970s, I think, was record everyone she met on three by five cards with their name and their birthday and and their contact information on paper cards, and she would keep in touch with everybody. And I'm sure that that helped her enormously in her career. I've never been as good at that as I should. I'm never as good at keeping keeping up with my old friends. I'm always busy, and there's always a crisis, and there's always something going on. But I think that. To, to appreciate the people that you're exposed to and to, to connect with those people and, and to think about where they've been and what they've learned and also you think how they can help you achieve your goals. I think that's that's terribly important. Um, you know, I, I think for me, I, I, I've also tried to keep in mind that I've been pretty lucky and, and to try to think that I kind of owe something for that, that I want to try to give back, that I want to try to make sure that I make a positive difference for the people that I am responsible for, whether it's people in my embassy or the people in my, uh, um, the people in my, you know the people that we work for, and in this case, really for Romania and for America to the extent we we work with Romania. The um, I think one of the things that I 
I would have liked. One of the things I try to do that I, I feel maybe I didn't have as much as, as I could have had is, is good advice and support from my um, from senior people in my profession. There's something about the way my career path progressed that I didn't have a lot of a lot of mentors around. There were a few people there who gave me some advice from time to time, but I, I feel I really try for the newer officers and newer diplomats and local employees, I try to be a source of advice and support. Um, that's something I think is, is very important in all organizations, in and out of organizations in life, and, and sometimes I'm trying to make up for, for that. I think uh, those are, you know, those may not be the, any, I don't have any key to answer everything, but I think that's all good advice. <laughs>